Gerstein, and you've tuned into Kiro Gerstein Invites. This is an online forum hosted by Kronberg Academy, and we're gathered here online. We've been doing so for the past uh, two years through pandemics, now wars and other calamities, and I'm thrilled to have as my guest today Dr. Hachik Muradyan, a historian, a writer, a teacher. He is at Columbia University. He's an area specialist at the Library of Congress. His book, The Resistance Network, The Armenian Genocide and Humanitarianism in Ottoman Syria, 1915 to 1918, was published uh, last year in 2021, and I highly recommend it. And um, some of, I think, the book is what... Um, Hatchik will talk about today. Um, I think it's particularly timely uh, because this week is uh, when the Armenian genocide is um, commemorated. I believe it's this um, Sunday, falls on Sunday on the, on the 24th. And that calamity, that uh, tragedy is as uh, actual as ever. So we'll talk all about that. And I uh, just wanted to say a couple words about the uh, the music that you just um, that you just heard. This is an iconic piece by the great Armenian composer, priest Komitas, and this was sung by a tenor that was associated with him, a historical historical figure as well, named Armenak Shahmuradyan, and. There is discussion that possibly this Komitas himself playing uh, playing the piano in this case, and the song Antuni is um, often translated as homeless, but um, 
musicologist and composer Artur Avanesov uh, wrote to me something very interesting recently. He said, uh, Artuni is now translated as homeless, but it was not the case during his lifetime. Antuni was a genre of poetry and tune means both home and poetic verse. So it literally meant strophless. So Komitas gave a whole new meaning to it. And in this particular song, he has done quite a bit of editing, even the lyrics. So it's as much Komitas's composition as it is a folk song. And I think in that sense, that may be a theme here as well. But welcome, Hachik. And just a reminder to everyone, your participation is essential. So please ask questions, comments, and I will pass them on to Hachik and we'll weave them into the discussion. But here we go, welcome. Uh, thank you, Kirill. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to be here to join uh, this program, which I have followed over the past year, at least. And uh, so today, what I will try to do is explore uh, the theme of the Armenian genocide from the perspective of uh, resilience, resistance, and at the same time, reflect on uh, some aspects that, as you mentioned, are uh, current today. And unfortunately, it seems that uh, they're current uh, every day in, in our world that uh, relate to mass violence, its legacies, and the way in which we can uh, push back against it. So I, I want to start today's journey by uh, perhaps uh, the very site that is considered the, to be the uh, darkest corner of the Armenian genocide. Uh, some scholars have referred to it as the Auschwitz of the Armenian genocide. Others have referred to it as the ground zero of the Armenian genocide, a site in modern day Syria, in Deir ez -Zor, where uh, in the summer of 1960, following a series of deportations, massacres and dispossession, of the indigenous Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire beginning on April 24, which is the Armenian Genocide Commemoration Day, uh, around a massive round of uh, massacres uh, takes place in, in, in that site. Growing up in uh, Lebanon uh, during the Civil War, Derzor uh, loomed large in, in my reality uh, for a number of reasons. One, Beirut, where I grew up was not too far from Syria. And oftentimes when uh, the circumstances permitted, in April, uh, students had the opportunity to actually visit their resort, visit this site and uh, pay uh, their respects at the mass graves and, and the memorial there uh, dedicated to the Armenian genocide. As a child and later as a teenager and into my 20s, on numerous occasions, I had this opportunity through school, through university. And uh, somehow I always avoided that, that trip. And I, uh, at that point, I, I used to say that, you know, for, I, I don't want to go to that site uh, alone or with other students in this morning. Uh, shall we say, uh, process. I would like to go there with, uh, you know, Turkish writers and journalists, and, and I want to share that experience with them. That opportunity came uh, much later. Uh, in, I was well into my 20s when in 2007, uh, sorry, 2009, uh, uh, I had the opportunity, I was in my early 30s actually, I had the opportunity to uh, finally uh, visit the site. And I'd like to share a couple images from, from, from that trip. So this is in the, in the fall of uh, 2009. I visit their Zor in, uh, in Syria, uh, the vast, often referred to as a desert uh, area where more than just in this region, more than 200,000 Armenians were massacred within the span of a few weeks. 
the region is dotted with mass graves. And when we arrived there, a new one had recently been discovered, uh, a mass grave that actually was featured in uh, on 60 Minutes uh, around the same time that year. We visited this, this newly discovered site in, in the village of Boucher, and the locals tell the story of how uh, a school was being built in the area and they started digging you know, digging up for the foundations and, and bones started protruding, which is why the school was built next to that site as opposed to on it. Now, what the site had become is the playground for the children of the school. You see uh, the image here. Uh, this is the mound, essentially, the mass grave where uh, the, the kids play. And all we need to do is scratch the surface and pieces of bone will, will come out. This is something that's known for the, by the locals. Uh, you ask the children, we're asking the children, what is this? And they would say, Armani, Armani, Armenians. And uh, when we were, when they noticed that we're, we're looking for, we're, we're looking at these uh, pieces of bone, they started bringing uh, pieces to us as well. Standing here uh, at this site, I, I was struggling to make sense of this. I had just started uh, a couple of years earlier uh, my PhD program and my dissertation topic was supposed to be uh, something related to uh, you know, the Armenian genocide in, uh, in the heartland, in the Ottoman heartland and not in Syria by any stretch. But this experience was uh, transformative for me in a number of ways, because I uh, embarked on a journey to essentially tell this story. The reason I settled on it is because even though there's always such a central site for the Armenian experience, for the Armenian genocide, for combination of reasons that I will get into in a little bit. It was uh, understudied. You encountered it in memoirs, documentaries, accounts, you name it, right? But there was no robust scholarship about what happened there, how it happened, and what led to that particular crime. Now, uh, and that, that became my uh, initial quest. So ultimately, in many ways, my project was going to be uh, one on the Armenian genocide, the second best studied case of genocide, by the way, after the Holocaust, that is largely defined by death, horrors, destruction, denial, and dispossession. Uh, there is this cloud of almost inescapable, in, in the scholarship of the Armenian genocide that largely focuses on, on these themes. And, uh, and, and that was, you know, my work was going to be well situated within that, under that cloud. But something shifted over the next couple of years. Uh, it started with, uh, immediately after I came back, uh, The Economist, so the Turkey correspondent for The Economist was with me on that trip to Berzor. And she published a piece in The Economist uh, a few weeks later, describing what we saw. It's titled Bones to Pick. This was a time when Turkey and Armenia were in, uh, in an effort to normalize relations. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, it feels like we're back to the same point uh, now. Uh, the first paragraph is quite telling. It says, the bones protrude from the earth. An Armenian priest extracts them, praying quietly. Syrian secret police in a green jeep look on. The residents of Busaira, a village 35 kilometers south of east, southeast of Derzor, claim the bones are of hundreds of thousands of Armenians marched into the Syrian desert and slaughtered by Ottoman forces in 1915. And then there's a quote here that I gave the journalist. Donkeys are now defecating on the bones of my forefathers. They were not allowed dignity, not even in death. Now, I 
this is how I felt. And you can sense the, the anger, the frustration in, in those lines. And in many ways, uh, you know, this was uh, my path at that point was to tell this story and, 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 and the horrors that were committed there, the, the largest mass grave of the Armenian genocide. But somehow along the way, I, as I uh, went into the archives, I worked in the Ottoman archives, I worked in Armenian archives that were uh, under-researched, including the archives of the Armenian uh, church in Aleppo, Syria. Uh, fortunately, I was able to receive copies of many of these archival documents uh, that eventually for years after that were not just accessible, but the entire uh, region was inaccessible. And with every passing month of work on this, something else started emerging from this story of darkness, death, and destruction. And that was a story of resilience, the story of organizing individuals pushing back in many ways against the policies of the Ottoman Turkish leadership to destroy and annihilate the Armenian people. And Soon enough, I also realized that this is not just individuals working and pushing back as people generally do, right? We do not go, you know, silent into that good night. People will always resist, will always find ways to, to push back, even in the most difficult and limiting circumstances. But I realized that something else was happening here. The more I familiarize myself with, the, with, with this cast of characters who are engaged in, uh, efforts of unarmed resistance, saving people, et cetera. I'll talk a little more about this later. The more it became clear to me that this was not just a series of uh, efforts that somehow pushed in the same direction, but there was this informal underground network of unarmed resistors uh, comprised by primarily Armenians, both deportees from all over the Ottoman Empire that were forced into these marches and had arrived in Syria and uh, those who had survived. And, and also uh, Western missionaries, diplomats, local Muslims, Arabs, Kurds, others, uh, local Christians, local Jews. And these efforts uh, suddenly uh, you know, emerged in a way that sort of pushed me to write a book in a different direction and hence the title, The Resistance Network. Uh, it's still a book about the Armenian genocide and therefore it's still dark. And there's still the horrors and the crimes and the way in which genocide generally uh, unfolds. But it also is at the same time, a story of uh, how even in the darkest corners, even in the less least uh, likely scenarios, how people will not only uh, be resilient, but also they will resist and they will organize and resist. Uh, and this has shaped my thinking on mass violence, on, on the aftermath of mass violence, how we write and uh, talk about mass violence, how we express it in art, education, uh, and, and how we struggle against it. And, and seek justice in, in courts, in the political arena, and on the streets. So in many ways uh, today, uh, I, I'd like to talk about this resistance network and some of uh, what I have learned and how my thinking has, has been shaped uh, as I uh, went on this journey. This is a journey that starts uh, perhaps one, a place as good as any to start would be uh, the night of 24 April 1915. As night fell on that Saturday, Turkish police officers paid surprise visits to dozens of homes in Istanbul. Within hours, uh, a who's who of writers, artists, doctors, lawyers, and secular and religious leaders, uh, Gomidas, by the way, uh, we, we just listened to Antuni, uh, among them, 
found themselves uh, greeting one another at, uh, at an unlikely rendezvous spot, the Ottoman capital's central prison. Uh, humidity and dread filled the air, but, but most were hopeful that they would soon be released. And as they uh, yeah, lay down to rest that night, they could not have imagined that their journey into the darkness had just begun, that it would soon engulf their entire nation, that April 24 would crystallize the affliction of their people, and that generations of Armenians would adapt that date as a synonym for a crime that at that point did not yet have a name. On that night and in the following weeks, uh, hundreds, uh, some 20, 220 Armenians in those few days were arrested and uh, in, in subsequent days and weeks were exiled to Ayash and Chankara, near Ankara. And uh, only a few of them, uh, thanks to good fortune and interventions, were saved. The rest were uh, exiled and killed. At the same time, uh, the Ottoman Turkish authorities, the ruling uh, Committee of, and, uh, of Union and Progress, CUP uh, party, enacted uh, a series of orders and laws that targeted the Armenian and in general, the, the Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire, including Assyrians uh, and Greeks, uh, the dispossession and deportation of the Armenian Ottoman Armenian population, forcibly removing hundreds of thousands uh, from their ancestral lands and marching them in the direction of Ottoman Syria, where the core of what I'm going to be talking about is set. Uh, robbery, rape, massacres were the order of the day. Komitas was among those exiled to Chankara, but through the intervention of the US ambassador, as well as others, he alongside six or seven others were allowed to return to Istanbul shortly after those arrests. On his way back uh, from, uh, from uh, where they were incarcerated, the Komitas witnessed a convoy of Armenians and learned about the horrors committed against them from others working uh, in, the, in, those, uh, in those areas on his way back to Istanbul. So ultimately, the Overwhelming number of deportees who survived these initial massacres along the route and uh, were uh, arrived in what is modern day Syria and at that point was Ottoman Syria. Uh, they were uh, mostly placed in concentration camps near Aleppo in Ras al Ain. By the way, these are sites that have been flashpoints in the war in Syria in, in recent years. As I was working on my dissertation and then on my book, you know, these sites were in the news over and over again, often associated with the crimes being committed there by different warring factions and, uh, and, and governments. And uh, so, so these, these towns and uh, cities, including Aleppo, Rasaline, and Derzor, uh, in addition to Raqqa, uh, the, the capital of the Islamic State, uh, you know, I was working on the dispossession destruction of Armenians in those very sites uh, just a century before. And although uh, exact figures are difficult to uh, you know, essentially uh, come up with, uh, largely because of uh, many uh, Ottoman documents are still classified and accessible, we can uh, say that close to 400,000 Armenians were in, in that region, were placed in concentration camps for months and ultimately massacred in, in their Zor. And a total uh, loss during the Armenian genocide during, for that period during the war of up to 1.5 million Armenians. Now, the survivors struggled to find words for the horrors that transpired in their Zor specifically. Uh, one, survivor, intellectual writer, Miran Ahazarian, you know, says death was for the fortunate. Aramandonian, uh, a chronicler, and one of the first historians, in fact, of the Armenian genocide, uh, writes how we envied those who were already dead. 
And so this town on the fringes of a crumbling empire that I visited in 2009 became shorthand for the deportation, dispossession, and destruction of the Armenians. In a poem titled Remembered Me, Remember Me, and this is a poem that I learned uh, by heart as a kid in school in Lebanon. A child survivor who became a celebrated poet, playwright, and educator wrote, This is written from the perspective of a child. You do not know me. I am that child raised with love who exhausted and half nude, fell asleep in a desert of their Zor, never to wake up. I do not want adornments, nor any warm woolen clothes, skeletons are always nude. But when you get warm bread from the baker, make sure to remember me. Now, Armenians did indeed remember the Armenian genocide and commemorate it from, uh, you know, immediately after the war, the war ended, World War I. But ultimately, what was often forgotten were those Armenians who organized and at the price of their own lives, tried to save as many Armenians as possible and, and try to uh, resist, provide assistance to the deportees and thanks to their efforts, uh, many thousand were saved. So for me, when I tell uh, the story of uh, any case of mass violence, when I talk about any case of mass violence, uh, I make sure that in my narrative, in my discussion, I am not just talking about what is done to the victims and not just placing the victims in a position of being on the receiving end of violence, but also talking about the ways in which the victims pushed back. And this is critical. And I start often in the classroom by asking students, uh, you know, can you tell me like uh, in one paragraph, in one minute, what happened say in the, during the Holocaust, during the Rwandan genocide, during the Herero genocide and so on. And then uh, we reflect on it. We reflect on how we frame this narrative and how much the agency and the voice of the victims is absent. And oftentimes uh, we feel perhaps that if we take away the voice and agency of the victims, if we constantly talk about and focus on what the perpetrators did and what happened to the victims, what, uh, you know, and we present the victims in this helpless uh, condition, we're actually making the crime look, uh, we are actually expressing the enormity of the crime in a better manner, in a more effective way. And this is what oftentimes drives uh, scholarship, journalism on mass violence, on violence in general, by the way, including, uh, you know, crimes, different uh, reporting on different kinds of kind of crimes, and so so this is this kind of narrative though again sort of reinforces inadvertently precisely what the perpetrator's intention is right, which is silencing the victim, erasing the victim and their voice and narrative from the picture right, and so so we are trying to uplift the experience of the victim, but at the same time we are. Uh, suppressing, you know, the victim's uh, uh, agency. So my, my, my work follows a tradition of challenging that. And in, about, in the case of the Armenian, uh, Armenian genocide, it actually pushes the discussion into this, uh, this, this open field. Armenians resisted as soon as the empire-wide arrests, deportations, and massacres were enacted. So there are sporadic cases of armed resistance in places like Van Musada, which is a celebrated case. The 40 Days of Musada becomes uh, the novel by Franz Werfel, published in the 20s, becomes uh, a, you know, a bestseller, one of the inspirations for the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So you know, there are these uh, few instances where you have you know, organized armed resistance to deportation by Armenians overwhelmingly. 
you know, these are local localized efforts, and these are crushed, and the survivors are, uh, and whoever survives are massacred or deported. Uh, the only circumstances under which people survive or are saved are when there's some kind of outside intervention, right? In the case of Musada, the French battleship will save the Armenians after they put on a fight for 50 some days. And in the case of Vaughan, they're going to be saved by advancing Russian forces from the East during World War I. But, you know, not everyone has access to weapons. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has training in weapons. And therefore, and not everyone has interest in using weapons, right? But that, of course, does not mean, you know, res resistance is not conditional on possession of this metallic object that propels, you know, gunpowder, you know, pieces of metal onto, uh, you know, the oppressor. And people will find other ways of pushing back and resisting. And this brings me again back to Syria, which is the case I'm going to focus on to make the point. Uh, so this is what happens in Istanbul, in Aleppo, where thousands of deportees disappear in the urban fabric and uh, receive support from this underground network of humanitarians. This is what happens in concentration camps across Syria. And you see that even emaciated Armenians, stripped of everything they had and dragged from concentration camps in August 1916, two massacre sites in Berzor took a stand. One example is this region of Shaddadiyah, not far from Derzor, where uh, a group of deportees, so these are small convoys of 5,000, 5, 4,000, they're taken out of the larger group, you know, told, they're told you're going to be, you know, deported somewhere else. Oftentimes they're told that, you know, there's amnesty and the government is allowing you back to go back home. So we're packing and going back. And uh, they're taken out. And, and massacred in the middle of the desert. But in the case of one group in which we do have survivors who were able to tell the story, uh, once they realize what is going on, having seen uh, you know, the experience of the previous convoys, they, they rebel. Uh, they rebel by uh, using tent poles and attacking the horsemen leading their convoy. Of course, the rebellion is suppressed, they don't have weapons, and all of them are killed. We have the names of a few survivors, and we who have managed, who managed to escape this massacre, this particular massacre, and, uh, and have told that story. And uh, it is these kinds of firsthand accounts that, you know, from, as I said, the darkest corners where, you know, journalists, missionaries, diplomats had no access to from where we have these, these shards of evidence and narrative. Uh, so there was a similar effort, not just to help and assist, but and also you know, stand up and take a stand, but, but a similar effort to collect information about what is going on and send it out of the country into Europe and the United States so that the world knows better what is going on. Beginning with the very arrests of April 24th. One Armenian journalist, prominent intellectual, who would eventually become a, a leading uh, also Armenian leader uh, after the genocide, Shavar Shumisakyan, he was on the list of those who were supposed to be arrested on April 24, 1915. He, on his way back home, he meets someone who tells him about the arrests of other intellectuals, religious leaders and others. And so he decides not to go. He stays uh, in hiding. Uh, someone else is, in fact, arrested in his stead and sent to exile. And uh, he goes underground alongside two others and creates this committee, part of uh, uh, an Armenian political organization that operated in Istanbul at that point that was essentially disbanded beginning in, with the Armenian genocide. He goes underground and makes his task uh, through a network of contacts who are writing reports about what's going on from across the empire and sending it to him to actually pass on this information to the rest of the world through the uh, Bulgarian uh, you know embassy that at some at that point was still uh, you know 
open and, and there was a possibility of communicating with them. Eventually, that will stop being the case. And that is how, by the way, the world at that point received firsthand details about what is going on during the Armenian genocide. So you can trace this committee's reports that are written in uh, special uh, ink, invisible ink, shipped, you know, first received from all over the empire uh, through different uh, couriers, uh, written in invisible ink on the sides of newspapers. Uh, we have these newspapers, by the way, to this day, and then shipped through, uh, you know, embassies, uh, friends, and others, and sometimes just sent by regular mail uh, to Europe. And from there, uh, these are decoded, and that's how the world learns about it. And oftentimes, even the very language that is used with these people in hiding will appear almost verbatim in European newspapers and in the New York Times and elsewhere. I, I say this because oftentimes, I mean, one of the things, one, uh, you know, documentation is such a critical aspect of, uh, you know, pushing for the crime. And oftentimes, groups that are targeted for destruction, groups that are attacked, will often go to great lengths to document what is going on. As they are being attacked and as are being, being targeted, as uh, one has the sense that there, there, there should be other priorities, right? Like saving one's lives and saving the lives of others uh, as well. You know, we see this today in, in the case of Ukraine, where despite the tremendous horrors being committed, right? Almost as the war started, immediately there has been and continues to be this effort to collect documentation. We see this in the case of Syria that I talked about. When, uh, one, to give one example, in, in Raqqa, when it was under the control of ISIS, this was one of the places from where information was impossible to come out. And, uh, and, and one group celebrated, sometimes criticized, uh, other times, uh, you know, so that there's, there's a complicated uh, aspect there, but I want to focus on the, the main element. Uh, one group of citizen journalists called uh, Raqqa being slaughtered silenced, silently, RBSS. That's what they do. They uh, try to break through the propaganda that ISIS is putting out by secretly filming, by secretly uh, preparing reports and smuggling it out of the city. And that is how we are now, I mean, not just now, but as, you know, uh, as the situation was unfolding, news outlets like CNN and others were receiving information and covering what was going on inside the city, right? So, so, so the collection of uh, and documentation is such a critical aspect, both in terms of uh, letting the world know and in terms of the possibility of future uh, cases, court cases, and, and efforts to pursue justice or crimes that are committed. So, uh, so that is another effort that was uh, under uh, underway, but. In the remaining time, uh, let me share a few uh, more images and, and some reflections on uh, the specific case of uh, that covers this region uh, that I look at. The resort that I talked about is towards the bottom of that triangular shaped uh, you know, area. Uh, these are, you know, on, the, on, on, on your left hand, you have Aleppo. And Ras al is towards the north on the on the right hand side, and this triangle is essentially the region where most of the most of the Armenian genocide survivors arrive and are massacred and and killed because of by starvation in camps and elsewhere. But this is where also the resistance network that I talk about uh, in the book uh, engaged in their work. Now, uh, I, I you know this image made made it to the cover of my book and. Uh, it did so for a, an important reason. It's, it's a photograph from the Nubar Library in Paris that depicts uh, some of the central figures who are involved in this unarmed, underground network of resistors who are trying to save lives, as many lives as possible during the Armenian genocide. It also demonstrates, you know, so, so at, the, at the center, you have uh, Nora uh, Altunian and, uh, you know, Aharon Shirajian standing right next to her. And it also is this demonstration of how you have uh, individuals, right, 
again, many of these people never fired a single bullet, uh, whose efforts through uh, in the darkest moments in the darkest corners, right, will transform uh, and will save lives and will transform realities, right? And uh, these are regular people. These are people that are often presented as victims and survivors and uh, individuals who hardly are thought of in the context of resistance, which is often uh, thought of just generally in terms of armed resistance. Here's a couple of quotes that sort of illustrates it. This is from the wife of uh, another uh, Armenian who was part of this network, Reverend Eskijan. Uh, and this is what she writes. As Reverend Eskijan you know, dedicates his life to saving Armenian deportees arriving in Aleppo, and the police was after him, uh, but ultimately typhus gets to him first and he dies of typhus that he contracts from the deportees in early 1916. So this is his wife writing a few years later. My dear Badveli, barely out of bed from his sickness, disregarding the personal hardships and peril of his own, to his own life, relentlessly labored day and night to save other lives. Together, we pressed ourselves to the very limit of our endurance. All our time, energy, effort, sleep, food, clothing, and other material possessions were put on the line in behalf of this wretched, miserable mass of torn and battered humanity in reference to the Armenian deportees arriving in Syria following those massacres. Teenagers were involved in resistance. Kids. This is John Minasian in his memoir, Many Hills Yet to Climb, writing, I became a messenger from the railroad station back to the reverend's house. The reverend here is still Reverend uh, Eskijan. The dangerous job. I, I took the sick to the physician and worse yet visited daily almost all the underground hideouts in Aleppo. College professors, ministers, and young graduates in hiding were all subject to arrest. The reverend would give me money to hand out to these people and they in return would ask me to buy food for them or a little charcoal to warm their cold, dark rooms. They were in constant fear that the government arm would reach them and redeport them. It's worth noting here that the Reverend, where did the Reverend get the money from? The Reverend got the money oftentimes, in fact, from the US consul in Aleppo, uh, uh, Jesse B. Jackson. The US consul in Aleppo himself received the funds from uh, the United States, there was this major humanitarian uh, effort, one of the first in, in modern US history, uh, which raised uh, a couple billion dollars in today's money, uh, beginning with the Armenian genocide, but also in its immediate aftermath. But again, uh, and, and there's vast amount of scholarship and, and writing about this. But what is missing in the narrative is that this money, you know, during the Armenian genocide, it was not possible for you know, humanitarians and missionaries to just go around and distribute it to the Portuguese, right? A group that's targeted for destruction. So there was this underground group of Armenians who are secretly, right, uh, engaging in this effort to smuggle the resources, the funds, uh, to buy medication, food, etc., and try to keep as many people alive as possible as the authorities were going after them. Ultimately, most of these people would be killed, would die of exposure, you know, my book is this, you know, the, the central figures in the book of the network will not make it to the end of World War I. But those who do, and the legacy of the lives that they say will essentially shape the post-war reality uh, of Armenian life and beyond. The very notion of an Armenian diaspora rebuilt in the aftermath of the Armenian genocide, largely, you know, stands on the shoulders of these men and women and children. This is one example of a committee that was involved in this effort, initially openly, and then ultimately as the government started arresting people, they go underground. The priest seated at the center is arrested and is only managed to escape uh, as the Ottomans were defeated in 1918 and were withdrawing and the, the prison essentially, uh, you know, there's this major prison, uh, you know, escape uh, opportunity and, and, and he escapes the prison. The archives, archival material that I use, uh, and these are samples of it from the Aleppo Armenian uh, uh, prelacy, uh, document 
the work of these committees, underground uh, committees that took minutes every day they, they met. Uh, it's like having a camera, you know, as uh, you know, I, I often say uh, in, in the, you know, in Aleppo as, as much of this is unfolding. Uh, this is another uh, series of documents listing every single deportee arriving, the towns they're coming from, et cetera, in order to dis distribute funds and assistance. Uh, this is, these are receipts. Every single egg, piece of wood, bribe that is given to Turkish gendarmes to save people, everything is documented. Everything is kept as the war is unfolding, World War I, as the genocide is unfolding. And, uh, and this is again a ledger where, again, all these expenses are documented. Ultimately, what we see here uh, through this effort is the ways in which uh, people will uh, push back and the ways in which that pushback will echo uh, across uh, decades and shape uh, different realities. And the implications of this are, as I said, uh, you know, going into the study of the darkest corridor of the Armenian genocide and emerging uh, by writing a book about resistance instead of writing one about just, uh, you know, brutal, senseless massacre of women and children who had survived the initial violence of the genocide, essentially uh, made me think uh, entirely differently about how we educate, how we write, how we think about violence, and, and the ways in which uh, that manifests itself today, uh, every turn in every corner. Uh, this is a conversation I have with my students uh, every semester, every year, with, with one crime being unfolding in front of our eyes, and another, and another. The importance of uh, focusing and highlighting the voices of the victims, the importance of breaking through narratives of helplessness, which oftentimes, by the way, go, you know, operates along gender lines. We, uh, we have a tendency, I mean, this is something that's rampant in the media, representing women, weeping women or children as, you know, as symbols of victimhood. We see this in Ukraine as well. Most recently, you know, uh, one of the covers of the New Yorker, for example, depicted that kind of uh, uh, you know, image. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's critical to also think about, uh, you know, the much of how our realities are shaped. Regardless of who wins wars, who emerges, regardless of the outcomes of genocide where almost entire nations are wiped, often relies on uh, where we situate ourselves as the victims are inevitably and invariably pushing back. We can situate ourselves as observers, as bystanders. We can situate ourselves as humanitarians who are going to save people, and we know exactly what we want and what the people who are on the ground fighting and pushing back, uh, you know, we know better than them. We often, uh, over the past century, our humanitarianism has been shaped by an approach to trying to lead efforts instead of walking next to those who are engaged in efforts and you know targeted groups who themselves know how you know these uh what what is what works best for them so ultimately though to wrap up i want to go back to this image this is uh again the picture of in there's sort of my visit in 2009 with the kids in this photograph and i had a habit often to often show this picture when I talk about their zone and ask this uh, rhetorical question at the end of my talk. I would say, I wonder where these children are today. You know, after years of war and bloodshed in their zone and Syria, right? And their zone was one of the, you know, flash points of, of, of crimes, mass graves, violence. Uh, 
I asked this rhetorical question. And I asked this question because I wanted us to think about right, uh, how the long shadow cast by genocide and the way in which communities emerge from under it and fight and push it back. I want to think and hope about the possibility that one day these kids are going to be growing up in an environment that understands their struggles, in an environment that stands next to them as opposed to things that knows best about what's good for them. In an environment where maybe them, and if not them, their children and grandchildren will one day become lawyers, doctors, professors, and will one day stand uh, in front of an audience, uh, just like I am right now, and uh, tell the story of their ancestors. This was a rhetorical question for me. Until uh, months ago, I received a message from on, on Facebook, on social media, from a man who told me that actually that boy in the front of the picture with the white t-shirt died during the war in their Zor. And in many ways, The world that we inevitably help shape with our actions, with our inaction, uh, and the, with the way in which we engage in our actions, we essentially determine uh, the path for those among those boys who are in refugee camps, who are scattered across the Middle East, perhaps Europe and beyond, and the way in which we're going to be telling the st their stories and the stories today of the crimes that are being committed and the way in which the world is going to be shaped in the future. Because I strongly believe in, you know, in, the, in the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, right? To quote uh, the, the, the great thinker, that uh, even though there is extreme asymmetry oftentimes, and we're watching it and witnessing it today, Right, uh, what echoes uh, over time and across generations will often be the efforts of the victims and those who stood with them. You know, the Martin Luther King quote that says, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice. I, I, I keep telling my students that it doesn't just bend. You have to constantly bend it and you have to constantly remain vigilant, vigilant about it uh, you know, moving in that direction. And I do think that uh, an appreciation of the voices and the resilience of those who are targeted and the, their vision for the world can very much help make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Hatrick. This is uh, wonderful and moving and so poignant and makes, uh, makes me want to pause and um, and contemplate on the other hand there are so many uh, um, follow-up questions that that I have and we have some wonderful uh, questions from our participants that I'll I'll uh, pass on as well and uh, beautifully said the um, the symmetry of the of the situation and of course so so much of what you said resonates in and one is reluctant to say it in other examples of of genocide uh, before and after and um and currently but um hard to even choose where to uh where to lead off but uh, we've had some wonderful questions by uh, a person with initials nk so i can't uh, give credit uh, of the full name but somebody is asking wonderful questions so the first one was why in your opinion the international community is now pushing for the recognition of the so-called ukrainian genocide happening happening currently in ukraine in ukraine's opinion says here in parentheses and is neglecting the armenian genocide of 1915 and 2020 that were a precursor for all the future atrocities of this type where is this selective silence and activism coming from There's a lot to unpack here and and uh, to elaborate on yeah certainly a question that has a number of uh components to it i'll try to briefly address some of them and if there's interest i'll i'll, I'll delve deeper into them but uh, a few points. One is that 
you know, the, the term genocide has uh, become uh, one of those uh, critical terms that uh, sort of oftentimes uh, targeted groups uh, aspire to be adopted because of the ways in which uh, it, it invokes a certain kind of reaction as the worst kind of crime because it uh, also uh, opens up the possibility of intervention. And uh, it is in that sense uh, critical. Now, it's important to note that of course, uh, you know, crimes against humanity, uh, if you're talking in terms of, you know, uh, ways in which perpetrators can be brought to justice, right? You know, in, in a legal context uh, are, are no less heinous and will put the perpetrators behind bars, right? For the same amount of time, right? You know, perpetrators of crimes against humanity will get life in prison and so will perpetrators of genocide, right? So in many ways there are, uh, and, and both uh, are, you know, are, are horrible crimes and this creation, creating a hierarchy of crimes and worthy and unworthy victims although is uh, an exercise that every group engages in, sometimes understandably, right? Every, we all want what's happening to us to be appreciated and understood. And we all want uh, that enormity to be conceived, perceived, and expressed. And uh, genocide captures that in ways that, again, many other uh, terms do not. Now, is this selective? Absolutely. Uh, this is selective, by the way, uh, largely, again, because of circumstances, because of politics. Understandably, I'm not saying anything earth shattering, you know, groundbreaking here. But also much depends on the efforts of those who are pushing for acknowledgement. The example of the Armenian genocide was given. If we just look at the past couple of decades, you know, and the way the major advances in terms of scholarship on the Armenian genocide, activism on the Armenian genocide, and the ways in, in which one European country after the other, some Middle Eastern countries and others, as well as countries in uh, like Canada and the United States have recognized uh, the, the Armenian genocide through this, again, effort to bend and vigilantly pursue bending that, that, that arc towards justice. Uh, is, is critical in that regard. And, and yes, oftentimes there's going to be pushback. Oftentimes there's going to be selective, uh, you know, approaches, et cetera. But ultimately that, that is a critical, critical component, pushing for that. Uh, that's one. The second element is uh, double standards. Double standards are uh, constantly being uh, raised in the current context and not just in the current context, right? Uh, in the early days, particularly of the war on Ukraine, there was an outcry and outrage, and there still is, on the fact that, well, where was everybody when people were being butchered in Iraq? Where was everybody when, Ye when Yemen was taken, you know, and is, right? The crimes were taking place in Yemen, Palestine, Palestine elsewhere, right? Uh, and there was this frustration in Tigray. And uh, same thing with the other, uh, the, the war on Nagorno-Karabakh with the horrendous, you know, taking advantage of the, you know, the, the pandemic to essentially ethnically cleanse an entire region of its Armenian population. Uh, so there was this justified uh, anger and frustration, but I don't believe, and I don't see uh, these issues in terms of some kind of competition. And I do believe, uh, you know, in the work of a scholar who actually thinks about what he refers to as multi-directional memory about the fact that these different experiences can, it's, it's not, uh, real, memory is not some kind of real estate. Uh, you know, he argues, uh, uh, Michael Rothberg, uh, where, you know, like if, if, if I lose something, it's your gain. And if you gain something in terms of the space of memory of a particular crime, I lose, right? It is possible for these memories of crimes, the way we think and remember them to actually work together and to, uh, you know, create a different kind of 
memorialization space. So that's, that's another critical element. Now, specifically, one final point. Again, I can delve deeper into these aspects, but I, I think it's better to just have some general themes out there this early in the discussion. Uh, and the third is, uh, you know, governments and their policies, which are often inevitably shaped through uh, interests. And, and there, uh, too, interest can also mean, though, uh, interests of their constituencies and how vocal their constituencies are and how hard their constituencies are pushing for a particular uh, cause and issue. And again, there, uh, you know, there is the possibility to break out of this sense of helplessness and impasse. It's not always there with the same uh, strength. You know, one of the things that genocide does, uh, let me take a step back, right? Yes, there is always resistance. Yes, there is always pushback and documentation. And, but, you know, it doesn't always translate in the real world into uh, how, you know, into that arc bending towards justice. There are entire groups that have been wiped, entire nations that have been wiped from the, you know, through genocide and mass violence from the face of the world. Uh, you know, destruction of Native Americans in this country, right, is, is, is a critical case in point. So it's also important to not romanticize uh, resistance as a sense of this inevitable, ultimate, you know, post potential for, for justice. Often justice is uh, messy and complicated and talk takes a long time. The efforts right now regarding uh, uh, Ukraine that have been initiated as I said from day one, the efforts regarding Nagorno-Karabakh and the war there, that, you know, efforts to document cultural destruction, uh, you know, aggression and others, right? These are going to take long years and it's going to be messy and it's not always going to end with the art bending in, in a particular direction. But uh, overall, I see no other way out than the path of solidarity and the path of struggle, which will not always be victorious, but, it's always, but it always is inevitably the path that is available that can lead to uh, an outcome that is different for us or the next generation. Let me stop here and perhaps we can come back to some of this. Yeah, I wanted to, to ask, and, and obviously some of our uh, participants are very well versed in the, in the history and the origins of the Armenian genocide and some are less. So if you could um, help us frame a bit the, um, as you see the root causes of this uh, horrible, uh, hateful outbreak that, um, that was in the, at the start of the Armenian genocide, and also what, in your opinion, ended it, or so, and did it end, and how did it end? So, um, so I think it would be helpful to understand how you view the start and the causes and 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 what brought it to to a close so to say yeah thank you so my uh my view of course is shaped by uh several decades of scholarship the work of scholars like raymond kevorkian tanya rakcham uh others and it's uh and it's also shaped by uh the evolving scholarship of mass violence genocide uh and, and here's, here's how I would uh, frame it. Uh, initial scholarship on the Armenian genocide essentially framed it in the context that was very essentialist, right? Uh, the Ottoman uh, Turkish leadership and uh, rank and file essentially was looking for just the opportune moment to annihilate the Armenians and dispossess them. And that moment presented itself during World War I. Uh, there is a grain of truth to this. Uh, and there is a trajectory, in fact, of violence, mass violence, massacres, and outbreaks of pogroms uh, beginning in the late 1800s, mid 1890s, and then again in uh, 1909. So, so you have these kinds of pogroms. But uh, a plan to uh, destroy the Armenian population in its entirety, deport and destroy, essentially, uh, create a space where Armenians do not exist in their ancestral lands, right? They're dispossessed and, and that region is Turkified. 
was one that was uh, largely uh, enacted during World War I uh, for a number of reasons. One being that uh, the authorities realized that this, uh, uh, in, in a period where you had leading up to that point, right? The Ottoman Empire was in decline, you know, although the term decline is a complicated one and many scholars would, that's a different discussion, but the Ottoman Empire was in decline. It has lost in decades before that vast territories, particularly in Europe, but also in North Africa and elsewhere. And it was shrinking largely due to uh, different groups uh, trying to break free from the empire, uh, you know, Bulgaria, Greece, others. And, and, so, and, and so the view was, so the first point, the view was that, you know, uh, this will continue. And, uh, and, and therefore we should create a space, particularly what was considered the Ottoman heartland, which happened to be the Armenians ancestral lands, right? Where this cannot potentially occur in the future, right? Uh, the Armenians themselves were largely not, you know, in any way, shape, form, uh, advocating for independence or anything of that sort. It wasn't even conceivable for most Armenians at that point. Uh, but they were indeed advocating for decades before that for uh, basic civil rights, for the right to actually, for their properties not to be stolen, for the systematic rape in many areas and regions and rural areas to stop, for dispossession to end, et cetera, et cetera. So there was engaged Armenian, uh, uh, you know, role that was being played activism, often falling on deaf ears in terms of the Ottoman leadership and often falling on uh, European uh, countries, often into Russia, uh, you know, the UK, France, uh, to a lesser extent, et cetera, were intervening every now and then, but oftentimes uh, pursuing their own, you know, uh, ideas and plans in the Ottoman Empire. So this was one aspect. So the Ottoman leadership, Ottoman Turkish leadership, aimed to solve a number of issues at the same time, right? One was, uh, you know, just the, the clearing, ethnically cleansing that region of its indigenous population. Second, through the dispossession of these people, the creation of a new class of uh, a middle class that emerges, you know, the, the founding of the Turkish Republic, right? Heavily relies on, uh, you know, the, this dispossession, right? In, in many regards. And at the same time, reducing these forms of uh, intervention. So this is critical. The other aspect is that, and this also, this connects to, to my work, it does not in any way, shape or form stop with just, you know, let's remove the Armenians from these territories, right? There, you know, these deportations are accompanied by massacres. In certain regions, the rate of destruction on site is up to 80% of the Armenian population of particular towns and city, cities. Others, it's, it's less, but ultimately uh, you have in this early period, hundreds of thousands of Armenians who are outright killed, not just dispossessed, not just removed from their lands. There's a second phase. Once these survivors arrived in Syria, there is a se second set of reasons for what transpires after in terms of massacres. And this is referred to often in scholarship uh, by scholars such as Raymond Kevorkian, Hilmar Kaiser, and others as the second phase of the Armenian genocide. And here in the second phase, which my book essentially fully covers, most of the male population is already killed off. Most of the survivors are women and children. Many survivors are just dying, sometimes by the hundreds in concentration camps, at the edges of the Ottoman Empire, not anymore in the heartland, right? Yet still, there is a decision in, uh, in 1916 that starts with Rasulain and ultimately in the summer in Derizor to kill off yeah, large numbers of these survivors through massacres. Uh, this was outright uh, uh, senseless killing, not to say that what was happening before was not, but uh, and, and there are reasons for that, that one can speculate, right? We do know that yeah, these actions occurred. 
And it could possibly be because of fears that uh, should the Ottoman Empire lose the war, which is what happened, right? Uh, as some kind of uh, effort to bring them to justice. By the way, the, 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 uh, the, the allied powers right after, you know, at the very beginning of, of you know, in, in 1915, as the news of the deportations and massacres emerge, uh, in May of 1915, they actually issue a statement saying that the perpetrators are going to be held accountable, uh, in which the, the term crimes against humanity is used, right? One of the earlier cases where the term is used. Uh, and uh, so, so that may have most likely was a way in which you would just get rid of the population. So there is nobody to actually eventually uh, create a new Armenia in a defeated Ottoman Empire. And so that, uh, so there are, there are a series of decisions, or perpetrators, by the way. You know, gen genocide is not one of those things that just descends equally with the same level of uh, strength and power and, uh, you know, degree equally across space and time, right? There are local variations because of, you know, different, approaches by local authorities, et cetera, et cetera. And typically perpetrators, the top leadership tries to fine tune the machinery of that, right? By removing people who are recalcitrant, you know, this happens during the Armenian genocide as well, but, you know, killing some of some officials who are against, the, you know, orders, et cetera. So the, the, this is like a, a process, pushback, resistance from locals, from others, all of these shape these, these realities. And it's messy. It's not this kind of, so, every step of the way, there's the decision, the decision that's being made. This doesn't make genocide less bad, it actually makes it worse. Because if there is one decision and it's in the mind of a perpetrator, and then after that, everything is inevitable, it means that is the decision that actually decided the fate of everything that followed, but it's not. Every step of the way, the perpetrator is making yet another decision to continue, to expand, to do more, to kill more or to stop. And any understanding and thinking about mass violence, even the ones, that, particularly the ones that we're actually witnessing right now, is part and parcel of this, which also makes it very difficult to think about terms like genocide when it comes to Ukraine today, right? Uh, because, uh, but we do know that there are cases of utter destruction, just like I mentioned Raqqa before, where the attack on the Islamic State uh, to essentially remove the Islamic State from Raqqa led to herbicide, the destruction of an entire city. Egypt, it, it was one of the most destroyed cities in modern history through particularly allied, you know, US uh, and, and other allied forces bombing the city, uh, sometimes targeting civ civilians as well. So the same thing is happening in places in, in cities like Mariupol and elsewhere, where at some point we're going to have a much different understanding and appreciation of what, of the horrors that have un unfolded there. But, uh, to go just wrap up with, 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 with your question. I do think that the intentions of perpetrators are evolving. They're not always in one direction. And, and that does not make a crime less bad, it actually makes it worse because we're constantly making and remaking decisions that's having an impact on uh, countless lives. And uh, thank you. And, um, and as far as the other side of it, uh, of course, the tragedy has this uh, very long echo, as 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 you've discussed. But um, but how does it end the in this case the Armenian genocide? What ended the the mass killings? Is it the is it the fact that uh, World War One outcome and and the losing sides or or what actually stopped it or was it an intervention of the allies how do you view that yeah uh, thank you sorry i missed that part of the question uh so uh so the world war ends in uh in in syria and some parts uh, so uh, i mean genocide ends in syria essentially with the uh, ottoman defeat and withdrawal right uh by 1916, though, much of the aims of the perpetrators was accomplished. The destruction of Armenian community life was essentially uh, uh, near complete, right? So that did not exist. There were survivors scattered all over the region, 
but an organized Armenian community life was uh, destroyed. And uh, so World War I ended it there. And then in the period between uh, the end of World War I and the establishment and the emergence of the nationalist movement in Turkey, and ultimately that culminated in the establishment of the Republic of Turkey, uh, the 100th anniversary of which is uh, uh, you know, coming up, uh, in, in that period, of course, uh, many of these policies are continued in other parts, particularly in the interior, with uh, and in the direction of the Republic of Armenia, this fledgling nascent state that emerges just for two years, and then it's essentially crushed between an Ottoman onslaught and 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 and, and the Russian, uh, you know, pressure on the attack on the other side. Now, uh, so in a certain in certain ways, putting. Uh, it's, it's always difficult, of course, to point to the big, to a beginning and an end. And uh, there may be, it may be easier to point to a beginning, even though this is, as I said, a culmination of uh, earlier outbreaks of violence. Uh, the end is even more difficult because in decades that follow the establishment of the Turkish Republic, uh, oftentimes genocide, the outright killing stops, but that asymmetry that is already, that's already like enshrined and, and finalized is maintained in other shapes and forms, right? That structural violence becomes the order of the day, right? And it, it pervades and permeates everything in, 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 in life. And, you know, as scholars who have written about the aftermath of the genocide inside in Turkey, beginning from the 20s and onwards, uh, Blair Knight, McJohn, uh, Talin Suchian, and others have demonstrated so effectively, uh, you see. Uh, that these policies you know, have taken a grip of the system, the structure, and the dispossession uh, of Armenians continues. You know, there's, there's work on this by Turkish and other scholars as well. The pushing Armenians out of the Armenian heartland continues. Those few survivors who eventually go back are, are pushed out. And, and in that way, uh, you know, the echoes of genocide continue. Another way in which the echoes of genocide continue are, is the destruction of cultural heritage sites. Before the Armenian genocide, there were some 2000, uh, you know, Armenian churches, monasteries, small, you know, houses of worship and prayer. Uh, most of which are uh, essentially destroyed. Not just during the genocide. In fact, a lot of the destruction happens in the decades since. So there's that cultural, destruction component that uh, continues, initially organized by the state and the military, uh, more recently, essentially through neglect, through uh, you know, treasure hunters who essentially dig up for Armenian gold, right? Uh, this process of robbing the Armenians over and over and uh, through it destroying their, their cultural heritage, but most importantly, in terms of politics. Uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide and its manifestations in terms of concrete manifestations, in terms of what we saw with the war on Nagorno-Karabakh and Turkey's absolute total participation in it on a number of fronts, or the active uh, denial campaigns of the, of the past decades across the world as uh, Turkish embassies and consulates and diplomats were pushing back against efforts to acknowledge the Armenian genocide. All of these are still part of, you know, keep this sense of ind indignation alive among Armenians. And this sense of how, uh, you know, you know, this in, in the grip, you know, keep, uh, keep this, the target group in the grip of the violence that just manifests itself in other ways. Uh, so so in, in certain ways, the Armenian genocide uh, just like several other cases of mass violence, uh, is ongoing, right? Today, uh, you know, the legacies of slavery, right, uh, have shaped in many ways uh, the structure. And that is what is being challenged and shaken in recent years uh, in the United States. I, I always, it's, it's always important to not always cross the ocean and also look in, in our own backyard and, and critical. So I, I do think that, uh, uh, you know, genocide will cast that kind of long shadow and, and it will, uh, it's always difficult to put this endpoint. 
but 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 as historians, there is a point, you know, when the killing stops, right? And there is a point when it morphs into something else. Uh, how uh, individuals and survivors are experiencing it, when it ends for them, uh, depends on a host of issues. And for many, uh, it ends when they die. The survivors of the Armenian genocide. As a child, I used to see survivors, you know, lining up the front tables of commemoration events. Most of those men and women that I grew up with are not around anymore. And when the United States, other countries, some progressive intellectuals, activists in Turkey began recognizing the Armenian genocide, most of those women and men were not around. I never saw that. I never saw that incident. And that I, I, uh, I never lose sight of that reality. And, 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 the, and the critical importance of, of the pursuit of uh, uh, truth telling, right? And, and, and justice for, uh, for, for these crimes that keep cascading and, and, and uh, you know, across space and time. Thank you. And this is uh, also why the work that uh, people such as yourself and historians and people that make the uh, the, the chronic of uh, of uh, events are also so, um, so crucial and important. And you covered a bit of what I wanted to ask next. And also it's a similar um, direction as another question by uh, by NK, who's provided such good um, questions. Uh, NK's uh, specific formulation is how has the policy of genocide denialism changed over, over the years in, in Turkey and Azerbaijan? And how are their governments keeping the lies and propaganda alive and spreading misinformation and anti-Armenian rhetoric? But um, you cover a little bit of that, but I wanted to also ask, so, um, it may sound naive, but in some way it's it's possibly correct to ask it in a straightforward way. Why do you think it has been so um, uh, problematic and, uh, to put it mildly, unsuccessful to get the uh, the Turkish government to to recognize the Armenian genocide and even the recognition of the Armenian genocide, if I'm uh, not wrong, has been so late in official declarations, even when the Armenian genocide has been um, recognized? Yeah, that is that is a, a very important question. I think that, so let me start with that and then go back to the how denial has evolved. So the there are a number of reasons that are central to uh, the fact that the, the, the Republic of Turkey has uh, so adamantly adhered to uh, this de narrative of denial and has made it a central component of its foreign policy. There was a, a very long time when, when you uh, visited the foreign ministry page, you know, the Armenian genocide allegations, you know, was prominently placed on the front page on top, right? That has, you know, moved a little bit in other directions for a number of ways, reasons that I will get into uh, soon. So uh, the, the reasons are many. One is that, uh, some, uh, you know, let me list a few that scholars seem to have consensus around. One is that uh, this is not just a crime that is deep in Turkey's past. As, you know, some of the ways in which some of the points that I made earlier illustrate, uh, this is an ongoing process. It has its manifestations in real life in the here and now. So that is critical. So, so the denial, the, the Armenian genocide is at the foundations of the establishment of the Turkish Republic. It incriminates the founding fathers, the way in which the legacy of slavery, you know, is often connected to, you know, the founding fathers of this country. So, and that is, uh, so it's, so that's, that's one critical component to, to keep in mind. Second, uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide is something that has been going on for decades. Entire generations have studied this in school, learned about it in, in, you know, through art, films, documentaries, everything, right? Uh, it's part of their reality. The denial is all they have known until very recently when 
through the internet, through some distant voices. In other words, an alternative narrative has been presented to a broader Turkish audience, right? And gen break breaking generations, denial that is built over generations and generations is not something that is uh, easily achievable. The third element has to do with consequences. And this also looms large in the Turkish psyche. There is this notion, there is this, uh, which is often referred to as the Sever syndrome among uh, you know, Turkish political elites and also an, a notion that is largely also uh, disseminated in the public discourse. This notion also of you know, like imperial powers trying, trying to uh, tear Turkey apart, right? And, uh, and, and that, is, that is a frame that's very much there. And the consequences related to reparations, of property, of land, territorial claims, and issues like that have always been uh, a, a central uh, driving force in sustaining the denial. Now, uh, to go back to the original, to the process of the denial and how it has shifted, the genocide denial, genocide denial, even though the term genocide did not exist, the denial of what was happening to the Armenians begins with the destruction of the Armenians itself. So we see the chief perpetrator of the genocide, the mastermind Talat Pasha, denying what's going on to the US ambassador. We see Jamal Pasha, who was responsible for uh, you know, the region of Syria, uh, you know, denying what was going on. So denial is all typically part of the, the very process of genocide. It starts you know, with the killing, and it continues long after the killing has stopped. And uh, over years, though, it has changed. So for the first 50 years, Turkey was not very much forced to actually deny, you know, because here's the thing, right? There's this conspiracy of silence, as some scholars would argue, about the, you know, mass violence. Uh, victims, for their own reasons, do not have the luxury to talk about demand, protest, and make their voice heard in the early years and decades after a crime. Uh, because they are dealing with other ish challenges, right? In the case of the Armenian genocide and other cases as well, right? It takes a generation, sometimes more, too, to rebuild completely obliterated communities, right? In completely different lands and new, uh, new areas, regions across the world. So the period leading up to the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide was a period where uh, this kind of vocal, activism was not uh, in any way prominent, right? Armenian commemoration was an, a more uh, internal within the community effort. And Armenians were engaged largely in some of the major uh, issues of the period, including the deliberations and the outcome of the uh, you know, genocide convention about which I've written. But this is one critical aspect. Ultimately, so, and the perpetrators, perpetrators don't just go around and say we killed, right? Or they don't just go around and say we did not kill. They do not deny unless somebody is making a charge, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's this conspiracy of silence where the victims are unable to speak. They have not established themselves. They're scattered around the world. They're rebuilding their own communities. They don't oftentimes not even the language of the land where they are. Uh, and that takes time. The perpetrators are silent because it's not in their interest to speak. And there's this conspiracy of silence that emerges, right? And with the establishment of the Turkish Republic and the interests related to, you know, uh, its strategic role, you know, international, you know, the United States, other countries, etc., that are trying to court Turkey, also have less interest in engaging with this issue, right? Even though it was at the forefront of the discourse in the early 20s, it gradually disappears in the United States and elsewhere. The 50th anniversary is a turning point because Armenians all over the world organize and start protesting and demanding justice. Thousands in cities, large and small around the world are doing this. In Soviet Armenia, there's this kind of outburst as well, uh, which is fascinating, taking into account circumstances on the ground. And since then, you know, this has become more of a process. Now, with the 60s and 70s, the Turkish state, uh, reaction has changed and denial has become something that they have done you know uh, routinely often uh, proactively 
right? Because the, the, the louder the voices for justice got became and the more amplified they were and the more scholarship caught up and essentially demonstrated how it is, the, this you know, denial became more vehement. And, but also it changed over time. So it, initial, initial position was one that was uh, deemed not tenable anymore, like in accusations that, you know, it was, it was the Armenians who committed genocide against the Turks, right? Those kinds of things, uh, you know, perpetrators will always uh, move the, uh, their, their positions to a place that's more tenable, that's easier to hold. It's like a battlefield, right? The struggle for, for truth. And that line, you know, uh, those trenches had to be abandoned, right? Of saying, you know, no Armenians were, Armenians were not killed, Armenians were just deported and we took care of them, et cetera. That narrative was abandoned. Uh, in the recent decades, the narrative is different. You know, unfortunate things happened. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Armenians died. You know, also many Turks died and it's like, it was wartime, et cetera, that kind of thing. In addition to a healthy dose of other kinds of denial, like, you know, it was the Armenians who did this and that, and uh, you know the, the typical narratives that you have. In addition to it, there's a lot of money that's being poured into it in terms of PR, uh, hiring, you know, uh, you know, companies to create these kinds of narratives, etc. That drives it. Uh, today, that denial has gone through several stages. There's fascinating work on this by scholars such as Jennifer Dixon, who's written a comparative study of uh, Japan and Armenia uh, and the Armenian genocide. Uh, so the, the, in the case of Japan, Nanjing massacre and the Armenian genocide in the case of Turkey, uh, there's other scholars who've written on the denial in its different stages, but denial will always meant, you know, shift and, and change uh, without surrendering its core tenets. And in the recent years, of course, again, because it's such a ch politically charged word and it's so important for Armenians, right? Denial has also become an integral part of Azerbaijan's, and it was part of the question, right? Azerbaijan's authorities engage in denial very actively, right, in recent years, uh, even past decades, right? Because it's it's a way in which you can essentially, uh, you know, attack, uh, you know, Ar Ar Armenians, uh, and and that that is one of the side uh, side shows that is often, uh, you know, not much attention is paid to, but it's it's there and has a tremendous resources behind it as well because of the petrodollars and everything else. I'll stop here and uh, I can say- Yeah, more. well, it's, um, it's uh, very pertinent also um, to the, to the uh, situation today with, with Ukraine. Peter, Peter Raj Singh uh, asked the question earlier, uh, Parev Prof, Professor Muradian, thank you for this insightful talk. Could you speak about the geopolitics of the time? Would you consider the genocide a failure of the great powers to put the waning Ottoman Empire on notice? But I thought to also um, take it in some way uh, to um, onto other occasions, uh, present day included. Is there something truly geopolitically that is possible to undertake to um, to stop genocidal killings in in its track and it seems that you know you just mentioned the the petrol dollars the economic and geopolitical interests and um, perhaps the frustrated uh, not to say cynical but the frustrated um, view could be that finally the world community so often has has done at best, just enough to uh, have uh, a plausible stance that you know we're shocked, we're displeased, we're horrified. But on the other hand, is there something one can uh, can do uh, aside from you know constantly waging world wars for issues that um, often the world powers are not even versed in the local local strife. Uh Thank you. Of course, this is a, a, a tough question. And, <laughs> well, it's a tough but important. And one that one that you know one can opine on. But I will try to uh, you know address it. Uh, you know, you know, take little pieces of it and address them perhaps. Uh, and 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 also sort of emanating from the other question, earlier question, which is also a great question about the 
the great powers and their role, right, in, in, in all of this and the geopolitics of the Armenian genocide. There's, there's a lot of good work on this, you know. Uh, Donald Bloxham has a book called The Great Game of Genocide, which really talks, looks at the great power uh, Ottoman Empire dynamics. Other scholars have, as well have written on this. And uh, here's the thing. The, I, I, I believe I heard putting the Ottoman Empire on notice thing, right? Uh, I think it's a, it's a complicated issue because, and this is one of the complicated issues with intervention in general, because intervention often comes at the intersection of uh, some kind of will to act and uh, interests, right? To be very just simple uh, in, in my statement. So, 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 so some kind of uh, overarching driving, uh, you know, interest of uh, what, you know, states, governments, uh, other uh, forces within uh, states and uh, has to line up with a push for uh, intervention. In the case of the Armenian genocide, it's not that the, uh, I would say it's not that the European powers failed to put the Ottoman Empire on notice. It is that putting the Ottoman Empire on notice was often conditional on interest as much as it was conditional on what was happening to the Armenians. And using it as some kind of bargaining chip essentially created a reality where uh, whenever uh, the European powers or this or that power got what they wanted, they took a step back. And then of course, uh, the Ottoman Turkish authorities did not really have the luxury of going after the big guys and turned around and massacred the Armenians, right? This is what you see over and over again in this period beginning in the late 19th century. It's, it's the inconsistency, it's the way in which it's a bargaining chip and the way in which that actually uh, muddies the waters and makes it more difficult to make claims of uh, uh, intervention for stopping crimes uh, without also at the same time raising issues of double standards, uh, et cetera, right? And uh, so, so that it is the complicated picture and uh, that leads to the Armenian genocide, right? And, and the Ottoman Turkish leadership realized at some point that as long as these Armenians are alive and here, we're not gonna hear the end of it, right? The Western powers will come in again, pursuing their interests. They will do, uh, they will demand this and that, et cetera. Turkey will throw them a bone. They will take a step back and then they will come in again because there's going to be more grievances, right? Uh, and you know they essentially say, you know what? Just let's finish this off. Let's end this. Uh, now, fast forward. Uh, it's it's also complicated today, and it's always has been, right? Because our interest, our uh, push for intervention has uh, varied depending on who is intervening for on whose behalf, where. Uh, uh, I, I wanna bring up, bring up again the, this idea of worthy and unworthy victims in the eyes of perpetrators, uh, in the eyes of you know, major uh, essentially stakeholders, right? And uh, so that is that has been one critical hurdle. Also public opinion, matters oftentimes in, in two ways, right? Public opinion that is fatigued of war will put pressure on governments and others to be less uh, interventionist. Uh, other dynamics will be at play as well, as I said, geopolitical, geopolitical interests, et cetera. And ultimately intervention itself is a complicated uh, dynamic. And with every intervention, the next intervention becomes even more complicated because, uh, and, and this is by the way, also the discussion today in a number of fronts when it comes to Ukraine, right? Uh, the entire discussion around uh, the International Criminal Court and how the United States now is, you know, both Congress and the, uh, you know, and the Biden administration are pursuing the possibility of uh, using ICC as a conduit for some form of justice for what's going on. At the same time, though, for decades, you know, you have Congress, uh, as, as, as many of us know, uh, have passed, you know, laws in 99, 2002, I think, 
that prevent the US government from supporting the ICC in any way, shape or form, precisely because the concern was that we do not, when I, when I say we, I mean in the United States, we do not want American soldiers to be brought to in front of, you know, for, held accountable for crimes, uh, for war crimes in, uh, you know, in, in these arenas. So you see how immediately, uh, you know, the fact earlier decisions uh, will immediately uh, undermine subsequent ones. And therefore the idea of intervention with every effort to not intervene or to intervene in a way that actually is extremely, uh, you know, comp uh, is extremely problematic and heavily relies on interests and, uh, you know, uh, is essentially complicates the next one and the next one. But, and in this kind of reality, and that's why I said this is tricky. It's like, what do you do? Well, I do uh, feel like uh, I, I'm, I am less cynical on, the, on these issues. And I do hope that, you know what, if the United States uh, is making an effort to turn ICC into something that has more, greater support, international support, uh, and perhaps this is my part to be naive now, my turn to you know pose a naive uh, question. Uh, perhaps it 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 creates a path, and it makes it more difficult next time around, when crimes, war crimes are committed this time by allies of the United States or the United States. It became, it makes it more difficult for the United States itself to actually say you know what we don't we don't work with the ICC, right? So even in in these uh, deeply uh, politicized, deeply, uh, you know, drenched in you know, double standards, uh, environment in which there is this push for pursuing uh, some kind of justice uh, for what's going on in Ukraine, which is going to be a very lengthy process. And it's going to, uh, it, it ha always has been, right, these kinds of processes. And it will, you know, invariably uh, not lead to neat conclusions. I'm you know, I'm from Lebanon. I grew up in Lebanon, and you know there was a special tribunal for the uh, uh, assassination of Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. And following the politics of that, right, and just you know from you know closely, I mean, it's just an example of how complicated these things can get, and ultimately how implicated different forces are in in, in outcomes. So uh, I do again to take a step back and 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 have a general thing. It's intervention uh, it's it's dangerous to throw intervention out as a solution for everything one uh, and it's dangerous to uh, because uh, I think intervention heavily relies on a track record but a way out actually sort of lies in the the picture that I painted in my presentation which focuses on those who are underground and 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 the uh, and and the way in which they envision uh, pursuit of just the pursuit of justice for their cause, right? And how we can help them achieve that. Uh, you know, some people. Uh, you know, so so in in different contexts, right? Uh, it's important to always have our ear to the ground and think about not what you know. How can this improve our position, say, regarding this larger struggle, geopolitical str struggle against Russia? And think about how can we uh, make help you people of Ukraine come up with the best decision that, uh, that they envision that gets them out of this war and bloodletting uh, as soon as possible. And these two things, it's uh, unfortunate, don't always line up. And one feeds into the other. And it complicates and turns uh, in intervention messy. Not to mention that, of course, great powers will, uh, you know, were back then and are right now, uh, you know, intervention also means that, you know, you, you're going against a nuclear power, right? One of the, you know, what, what we are witnessing now is the world feeling 
that we have to watch this because we cannot intervene. But then at the same time, we have to pour as much weapons into Ukraine as possible, right? Uh, so there are these considerations, additional layers and consideration as well that, again, complicate this picture much further. But I wanted to look at a couple of little pieces of it, perhaps to offer uh, some thoughts about both what happened 100 years ago and what is going on today. Um, I think you're muted uh, suddenly. Yes, I, I generally mute myself right after I stop. Sorry. Oh yeah, no, it's uh, you have uh, you have developed an excellent uh, Zoom etiquette over over the last years of uh, of teaching and doing uh, as much as um, you and we have all done on Zoom. Um, and um, it occurred to me, uh, for me, it lies quite on the surface, but in these sort of statements that have to uh, carefully measure past decisions and actions and and uh, own a situation, it's been fascinating to see how um, carefully, so to say, Israel has had to tread in the, in expressing their uh, outrage at the situation since um, Obviously, uh, a lot of a lot of follow up questions are um, are at the ready. I think from the from the international community. Uh, for a second, more on geopolitics before um, delving uh, back into the main themes. Do you think? And you know, one asks you these questions since I think many people here have also said, you know, we are uh, we're trying to learn from history. We're desperate to learn from history. I think to also to understand. Um, the uh, present and the future, but do you find sanctions work? Because there are there are quite a few seemingly enlightened people that uh, will say, well, you know, question is san sanctions is something we um, feel as part of that arsenal of well, we have to do something. And at the same time, if we if we look at sanctions applied in the last um, 50, 75 years, um, can we say that that's been an effective uh, tool in uh, in in bending also this um, this arc of moral justice uh, great question i am uh, i will only address it within the constraints of my own knowledge and and not venture into uh, making uh, more ambitious statements but uh, you know there are ways in which uh, that that I see uh, playing out in in, in Ukraine uh, of you know punitive measures and sanctions are certainly one of them in their different manifestations that are clearly making uh, uh, making an impact and making it felt at the highest level of decision making in Kremlin uh, and there are other sanctions that essentially cannot be farther away from that top leadership, right? In terms of the impact they're having. And they're largely having an impact on individuals who, uh, if, if the hope is that, you know, you know, certain circles because of these sanctions and the, and the horrors that are committed are going to suddenly turn and uh, turn the tide of the war, right? There, we have seen in the past that there's a lot of tragedy and suffering that emerges from that. And that is not an outcome uh, for the possibility of something like that to happen, weighed against the, the horrors of, uh, on civilians and on the weakest of the, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in communities is, is just not something that is worth going down in, in, in terms of trade-off. Iraq is a good example, right? Uh, and many other places, sanctions, you know, because of sanctions, you have civilians, you have thousands of children who die, you have, you know, you know, issues related to access to medication, matter, you know, and much of this played out. And, and again, the hope was that we press the weakest link, the, the weakest uh, of, of the community, not those who are privileged. And ultimately, we hope that they're going to rise up against their leaders and, you know, change will come. Uh, and that is a very dangerous, a very dangerous uh, uh, game that engenders a lot of suffering. This I can say very uh, plainly. Uh, of course, going after the resources and, and uh, of you know, the top leadership and those who are supporting them, and even those who 
are not dissociating themselves or distancing themselves from them, right? Outright. Uh, there, it's a different different story, of course, and I and I understand that, and I also understand that in a situation where, uh, you know, you have this kind of again asymmetric warfare, it is important to employ these uh, way uh, efforts in different contexts, right, to uh, bring about some kind of change, right. That's one. Now, uh, let me also say that uh, I am very uncomfortable when, for example say a uh, Russian uh, sportsmen, runners, are banned from participating in the Boston Marathon, right? I mean, not even people, you know, we're not even talking about, uh, you know, Russian citizens who happen to have a position that is pro-Putin, right? Or pro-war. We're talking about just a blanket ban, right? Which is a, 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 a form of sanctions. And I'm very uncomfortable about that. For a lot, you know, for, for, for a multitude of reasons that I know, I, I'm sure you, uh, of, you know, you know better than me in the particular world of music, right? Uh, so, so that, so, so, so the, the term sanctions for me evokes a number of different kinds of uh, thoughts about and about consequences. To wrap up this question, let me give one quick example that also is very unsettling for me. Uh, our efforts to pressure the those who are the most dispossessed and those whose voices is the least heard in hopes that the very top, the elite, the people who have access to billions and tremendous military resources is perhaps in one way epitomized in the effort of, you know, uh, the, the reports that have emerged in recent days of taking pictures of uh, dead Russian or killed or uh, Russian soldiers or prisoners of war and sending those images to their mothers. And the argument that when we do that, this is going to create an outrage about the horrors of the war and it may change something. And that is for me deeply disturbing. Uh, to hope that those mothers are going to feel outrage, which they certainly will, but not necessarily their outrage is not always and necessarily is going to be directed in the direction that is intended. And then to hope that those mothers are going to be transforming the conflict in, uh, the, and, and the carnage and the, and the horrors that are being committed uh, is, is problematic uh, in, in that regard, in a, in a similar manner. So I do view sanctions, and not just sanctions, but also different forms of intervention. Uh, I try to view it as a case-by-case -case basis. And I also understand you know, the horrors of being in a situation where you try to do everything at your disposal in order to uh, make this stop. But at the same time, I do think that uh, there are uh, complicated issues and questions related to some of the ways in which we engage in that. Absolutely, right. And, uh, and I think um, it's been, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it, and it's been pointed by by some commentators in the case of the uh, the Boston Marathon decision to exclude uh, Russian, Belarusian uh, participants. Uh, I think it was Brett Stevens in the New York Times who also points out that uh, this kind of blanket uh, ban in fact seems to be counterproductive because it only serves to strengthen the, the narrative for example, of the Russian government in this case, that, oh, look, everybody hates us and it's so unfair and unjust and in fact unifies and solidifies support rather than um, undermining it. And in my uh, very uh, small corner of the woods, we've, uh, we've seen it with, uh, with several music competitions that, that have decided to show moral outrage. Now, moral outrage is absolutely appropriate, but then by, by banning some 18-year-old uh, uh, pianist, uh, sometimes even uh, somebody that has been involved in protests against, uh, against the uh, regime, I think is so, um, so unfair and... Um, ineffective and uh, just uh, mis misdirected answers to strengthen the other narrative that uh, everybody everybody dislikes us whoever whoever us 
is. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, or to to pass on a couple a couple questions that came came in early, um, which are uh, very specific to what you were um, talking about. Um, there was a clarification question from Kandan Badim. Um, he asked, or she, I apologize, don't know, uh, 200,000 Armenians were called in Dertor, you said, uh, is that correct? Not 2,000. So I think this is obviously the um, one is stunned by the figures, but, uh, but you said 200,000, didn't you? Yes. Uh, there are numbers, there are higher numbers that are often, uh, you know, mentioned in, in the Dertor case. But uh, it is, uh, I, I, you know, in my work and uh, based on what I have seen, uh, the 200,000 figure up to 200,000 is, uh, is, is an estimate that is closer to than uh, other figures such as, like I've seen 400,000, I've seen very large numbers for theirs are. Uh, and this includes essentially uh, those who die uh, in, in the period when these camps are emptied and the population is, is pushed beginning in March. But so, so there's, uh, you know, in March in the line, there's a smaller massacre of up to 30,000 Armenian deportees uh, within general, the general there's our area. And then uh, in the summer, you have the second, second round of, of, of massacres. Uh, as I said, some scholars who have written on, the, on this phase before put the number on, on uh, you know, around 400,000. It's, it's, a, it's a massive figure. As far as 2,000 is concerned, just for some context, in the Meskhenek concentration camp alone, this was one of the concentration camps along the Euphrates River. Uh, there have been days uh, where we know that up to 500 deaths were being registered in a single day. This is not from massacres. This is from essentially people placed in concentration camps and left there to die. Uh, in many ways, during the Armenian genocide, you know, some of these sites were often referred to by the authorities euphemistically as settlement areas, right? And uh, essentially, the Armenian population was being settled under the ground, under the sand of the desert. Uh, so yes, the numbers are just uh, uh, huge uh, in in that regard. But but uh, but the figure two hundred thousand, I think, captures uh, what happens with these deportees uh, between the on-site massacres and the deaths that are occurring uh, after these camps are, are, are emptied. And there was also um, from, from the same participant, Kandan Badim asks, uh, were there local Armenians in Aleppo in 1915? This was when you mentioned also Aleppo and what happened to them? Yeah, thank you. So Professor Badem, by the way, is a professor based uh, from Turkey who has done excellent work on uh, a number of issues more towards uh, the eastern frontiers of uh, the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and the Turkish Republic. And uh, yeah, the answer is yes. There was a small Armenian community of up to 10,000 Armenians. Uh, Aleppo, in fact, interestingly, and I allocate uh, you know, quite some space to this in, in the book, uh, was constantly in the risk of the Armenian population, was constantly in the risk of deportation. And some were indeed deported, particularly those who had not transferred their registration uh, to the city and were listed as people from Sassoon and other areas uh, were indeed deported in the thousands. But there's a core community that is not deported. Uh, and they initiate some of these committees that start helping the Armenian population. And uh, they are targeted by the authorities uh, on a number of occasions and their leadership is arrested, et cetera. And until later, uh, and I know Professor Badem would appreciate this, in 1970, up to 1917, right, you have a telegram sent to Talat Pasha, the Minister of Interior of, of the Ottoman Empire and the mastermind of the genocide, saying that, uh, from the governor of Aleppo, saying that the Armenian community here is worried about deportation, right? And the response from Talat comes and says, at this point, the Derzor massacres are done, the Armenian population is decimated, uh, Talat's response is essentially is, tell them they're not going to be reported, uh, deported, uh, yeah, kind of response. And so that, so it's, it's also important to note that in a few other places, as uh, I'm sure Professor Badam knows, uh, Armenians were not deported. 
uh, in mass. I mean, of course, one example in my work is Raqqa, where there are orders to deport the Armenians to their Zohar for massacres. And the local uh, you know, Arab leadership uh, refused to do so. And, uh, you know, and, and, and there, are, uh, there are no major consequences to it. In other places, there, you know, there are consequences to uh, officialdom that refuse and are recalcitrant. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other places, including Kutahia, by the way, where Komidas was born, where the, where the Armenian population was not deported. In certain urban spaces where, that were at the, at the forefront of, uh, you know, where you had all these diplomats and, and officials, et cetera, and metropol metropolis, uh, metropolises like Istanbul and elsewhere, deportation operated differently. Like in Istanbul, uh, thousands were killed of workers, for example, migrant workers. Mm -hmm. The entire intellectual leadership was you know, exiled and killed. But again, the, the, the local Armenian population was just left uh, uh, largely un, untouched in this period. Thank you. And uh, an apologies to Professor Badum. Now I will, uh, I will know. Um, there's a question from Larry Davis, uh, who says, I've not yet been able to acquire it, but there is a book by Aurora Mardiganyan that I'm sure you know, The Auction of Souls, that was turned into a US film around 1918. What do you think of this book as a contemporary voice for what was happening among the Armenians at the time? Uh, uh, Aurora Mardiganyan's story is a tragic one on a number of fronts because uh, she experiences the horrors of the genocide and sexual enslavement, ends up in the United States. Uh, her experience is turned into a major, you know, a blockbuster film for its time. Uh, it's shown all over the country and is used to raise funds for uh, Armenian refugees. At the same time, though, uh, you know, she, she acts in the in, in her own you know, in telling her own story and and uh her suffering is in certain ways uh instrumentalized in, in in this in this entire process so it's a complicated narrative she's she lives on and there are later on there are several interviews with her that is conducted and she uh uh, uh and 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 her uh example and case is one of those very complicated ways that I was addressing earlier about how uh, humanitarianism works, how sometimes decisions are made that we think is better for the person or is better for whatever we're pursuing for that particular group. And oftentimes the consequences of it is not fully appreciated. There is uh, some good scholarship and writing and also some uh, great essays written by artists, scholars and others on Aura Madiga and her story, including one by uh, Ato Megoyan, the filmmaker, uh, in the Canadian uh, filmmaker who also made the, the movie Ararat. And uh, her interview, an interview with her, an oral history interview with her is also available online. Uh, we, uh, so that's, you know, and, 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 but I have to say that the film did have a huge impact. And help what raise was the name of the film? Asked uh, uh, the, the, uh, so so it has so it's auction of the souls, and ravished Armenia, ravished Armenia. Uh, also earlier, N K asked, what was the name of that organization that collected evidence and wrote wrote it uh, using invisible ink to get it out? So the name of the organization is uh, Armenian Revolution Federation, which had uh, you know chapters around the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and was a, one of the active parties in the Ottoman parliament in the, after the constitution is established. Uh, what happens is that just like the other Armenian political parties, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation's you know, newspapers are closed down and everything, its operations are stopped with the de deportation of the Armenians and the arrest of intellectuals. In fact, almost the entire leadership is arrested. Chavash Misakian escapes arrest, as I mentioned earlier, and he and two others uh, create a temporary body uh, called uh, uh, the temporary uh, body of Vishab. And Vishab is actually the name of the committee, of their committee in, in Constantinople. Uh, and it's uh, Vishab in English means uh, is uh, 
dragon. So this dragon temporary body of three people essentially coordinates this network that stretches across the Ottoman Empire. And I talk about parts of the network that is based in Syria uh, in, in my book, The Resistance Network. And I allude to the general effort in general. But I have to say every overwhelming number of these newspapers with the hidden ink and with the way in which, of course, it's you know, decoded later on, etc. All of them are still available in archives in, in Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah, that's amazing and uh, ingenious and moving. Um, just perhaps maybe a couple, couple more questions that are uh, wide, uh, so encircling and winding back to um, to the resistance net network. A particular one from Gary Artinian who says, congratulations to Hachik for his new concept of resistance during atrocities. How can Karabakh Armenians use these concepts of resistance and prepare for it if they lose their independence and helplessness uh, dominates? It's very important to learn from history with a capital H. Uh, again, another difficult question. And I, I try to be uh, careful when I'm being prescriptive. Uh, and I try to be not to be prescriptive when I can, uh, as much as I can. But here's uh, how I would think about this. In this specific case of Karabakh, so that I can be uh, a little more focused in my response. But, but also I think the argument uh, works more generally. What precipitated uh, the war in Karabakh, in Artsakh, what precipitated, precipitated the ethnic cleansing of the Armenian population there and the ongoing challenges to uh, the borders of the Republic of Armenia itself are, uh, did not emerge in a short period of time. This is the product of uh, close to three decades of militarization by Azerbaijan and militarization of the region in general but billions of dollars of petrodollars going into militarization, right? Uh, this is the product of, uh, you know, generations of leadership, uh, complacency, the product of uh, diplomatic inaction, issues related to intervention, non-intervention, uh, the kind of language that is often used in international diplomacy, the both sidism language, right? We always refer to whenever we want, you know, to, uh, you know, let me not say we, diplomats and, and you know, important stakeholders in the region, constantly, every time there was an, an attack, every time there was an assault on Armenians in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, you know, the statements always said, we urge both sides, uh, you know, to be measured, to be restrained, etc. Uh, crimes were not named by their name, attacks were not, attackers were not identified, and this uh, atmosphere was created where you got away with what you did because the worst that could happen is that both sides would be blamed for. And, and this also is, is part of the precipitating uh, process. So this is a process that's been a long time coming, and it's not going to be resolved in a short time. Although there is a sense of urgency because so much has been lost and uh, in terms of lives and livelihoods and land, uh, but at the same time, uh, and cultural heritage, by the way, that's constantly threatened and there's a vast amount of you know, documentation now about that and uh, the international media has paid a lot of attention to particularly that aspect more than anything else. Uh, but, but this is not something that's going to change in a short period of time. And I do think that in that regard, uh, uh, the, the forms of resistance that, that, come, uh, that manifest themselves are going to be the ones that will be uh, ready to engage on this longer uh, you know, effort to, uh, to transform the way in which uh, the current situation uh, has you know, paused. Right, there's, there's a, a pause button was pressed 30 years ago when the war, when the ceasefire was established. There was a certain reality on the ground. 
that uh, reality has changed drastically. And there's another one, and there's a pause button, pause button, button again. The decisions are made right now, just like the decisions that are made three decades ago by the authorities of Armenia, Artsakh, and primarily Azerbaijan, right? The decisions that are made today and the international community are going to shape the next 30 years. And, and there, I think it is a different kind of battle. It is a battle that even though the temptation is to be impatient because we're losing everything kind of feeling, I sense that among Armenians everywhere, uh, you know, that sense of uh, impending doom, uh, um, you know, just is difficult to translate it into immediate outcomes, no matter what happens on the ground. And, and that is, I think, how I would frame the, uh, the resistance. Let me say this, though, to more directly address this. A hundred years ago, the Armenian people, the Armenian nation, were in a much worse place. They had lost their entire homeland, up to a million and a half of their people. The survivors were scattered around the world and were starting everything from scratch. In that kind of environment, a Republic of Armenia was established, even for two years, that provided the foundation for the Republic of Armenia that we have today. In that environment, after that calamity, there, were, there are these vibrant Armenian communities that were created around the world. And some measure of justice, as this talk outlined some parts of it, has been achieved uh, in uh, both in terms of establishing truth, but also uh, moving towards, uh, you know, uh, reparations and other ways, you know, these are themes that we're gonna address. Uh, and if it was possible a hundred years ago for the greatest calamity of World War I, a global war, uh, a just transformation is possible today. That I know. But that, again, the arc is not going to bend on its own. The arc is going to bend with pressure on stakeholders. The arc is going to bend with people staying put on their ground and pushing for their, uh, uh, for their rights. And uh, dissident voices in certain circles that are pushing against this oppressive environment, making their voices heard. It's, it's complicated, it's difficult to predict, and it's difficult to be prescriptive about it, apart from the fact that it has been done before in worse circumstances, and it's not going to change overnight. Thank you. Um, maybe perhaps uh penultimate or uh, one final question from me today. Um, your book, The Resistance Network, is there um, its counterpart, so to say, or what are some of the reading, uh, highlighting uh, similar resistance network for the, um, for the Holocaust and uh, the Second World War? Is there, is there, um, sort of a counterpart book that you would point us to to learn about the resistance resistance networks in that in in that period and in that event uh thank you that's a that's a wonderful question in fact i'm flanked by some of those books i would not say there's one but i do think that first of all in holocaust scholarship which is vast uh the the uh, the scholarship evolved uh, much earlier than the genocide, of, uh, the, uh, the scholarship on the Armenian genocide on the issue of defining resistance, right? And uh, more broadly than just armed resistance, even though many scholars have for a very long time, Holocaust scholars have adhered to that narrow definition, a broader definition has been around for decades now. Uh, that has manifested itself in different ways uh, in looking at unarmed forms of resistance during the Holocaust. Uh, you know, uh, there's there's a book called, uh, well, in fact, Nekama textbooks on uh, resilience and resistance are excellent examples. There is a book about the titled, and I'm, you know, I'm just naming titles that are behind me or they come to mind right now in no way exhaustive. Uh, you know, a book titled Resistance of the Heart that essentially looks at a group of women uh, pushing for 
changing, uh, again, unarmed acts of resistance, essentially getting their Jewish husbands, uh, German women, uh, released before they're deported in Berlin. Uh, there are multiple such cases. Uh, there are a vast literature on uh, Nazi concentration camps and unarmed forms of resistance there. Uh, there's a vast scholarship on uh, the, the, the Judenrat and, and the cho their choices, and some of their, what one scholar refers to as their choiceless choices, and how to situate that. You know, uh, in my work, what I do is I place resistance, unarmed resistance, within a spectrum of reactions because not everybody right engages in resistance and we should not expect everybody to engage in resistance you know like we often uh, you know people should not be placed in a position where they're going to have to resist in order to, you know uh, and and some people don't and some people resist in other ways and some people try to escape so that kind of spectrum is much fully captured in the holocaust scholarship one example that I would actually give from another case that has uh, also an interesting parallels with the specific resistance network book actually has to do with the Underground Railroad in the United States and it relates to slavery and, uh, and this effort uh, oftentimes, you know, where you have, you know, hiding, uh, you know, hideouts where you have uh, some churches involved in the process and this under, underground network of actors, oftentimes members of the very targeted group, uh, who engage in efforts to save lives under extremely uh, horrendous circumstances. So there are uh, examples such as that as well. Uh, ultimately, I do think and hope that uh, our thinking on the way in which we frame uh, crimes and injustices uh, is is, is mindful of uh, of those uh, of those voices and of those actions, and we don't necessarily look for the outcome to judge if an act of resistance is successful. And this is this has been largely achieved in in, in Holocaust scholarship, but uh, significantly less so in many other regards. But there is a, a literature that is emerging now, even historiography, but also other forms and art and others that are that's trying to uplift this, this, these voices and even push back at the archive and the institutionalized archives that tell a particular kind of story because all the other stories are just suppressed and don't exist. And taking snippets of that and try to think about them and look at them differently and uh, in interpret them from the perspective of what the victims could have been, could have gone through uh, as there is this kind of violence that is uh, descends Upon that. That's a beautiful answer, and you've. Um, I think your your work is is giving uh, this hopeful um, hopeful nuance and giving voice to the to the victims, and as you as you said, giving giving them giving back the agency and not making them um, so just uh, passive um, victims of uh, these horrific crimes against humanity, genocides. And of course, uh, there are so many, unfortunately, that we um, didn't cover today. And, and one can always say, well, there are so many examples and we tend to focus on ones that are um, nearer or more familiar to us but i think your your book in the direction of your research um, is quite universal in the sense of uh, giving victims agency and showing that resistance and unarmed resistance amongst forms of resistance is um, is of crucial importance and um, and essentially human i'd say so i wanted to um to thank you for spending so much time with us for your insights that i know will help me uh think and and navigate uh, both uh, trying to trying to look at history and trying to uh, look and act within within the present and i want to thank everyone for for such wonderful uh questions and active participation Please uh, keep joining us, uh, keep questioning, keep uh, 
being curious and learning as all of you are. But most of all, thank you, Hachik. Thank you for joining us and for, for talking so inspiringly and insightfully. Thank you. Uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity of having this kind of in-depth conversation, which is, does not you know, happen that often in uh, uh, some scholarly settings where you know, we give a talk and then we speak. There's a Q&A for you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then that's it. This, this, kind, this is also an opportunity for me to reflect and hear more from the audience, from you. And uh, it was a very fulfilling experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. So be well and uh, more very soon. <laughs>